Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining today, today's DocuSign's fourth quarter and fiscal year 2019 earnings conference call. As a reminder, this call is being recorded and will be available for replay from the Investor Relations section of the website following this call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. A question and answer session will follow the formal presentation. If anyone should require operator assistance during the conference, please press star zero on your telephone keypad. I will now pass the call over to Annie Lachen, <coughs> Head of Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Thank you, afternoon. Operator. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to DocuSign's fourth quarter and fiscal 2019 earnings conference call. On the call today, we have DocuSign's CEO, Dan Springer, and CFO, Mike Sheridan. The press release announcing our fourth quarter and fiscal year results was issued earlier today and is posted on our Investor Relations website. Before we get started, I'd like to let everyone know that we will be participating in the J.P. Morgan Technology, Media, and Communications Conference the week of May 14th. As other events come up, we will make additional announcements. Now, let me remind everyone that the statements made on this call include forward-looking statements that are based on assumptions we believe to be reasonable as of this date and on information currently available to management, including estimates and other statistical data made by independent parties and by us relating to market size and growth and other data about our industry. Forward-looking statements involve known and unknown risks, uncertainties, and other factors that may cause actual results, performance, or achievements to be materially different from any other results, performance, or achievements expressed or implied by the forward-looking statements. Further information of these risks and uncertainties is included in our prospectus, previously filed with the SEC, and additional information in our October 31st quarterly report on Form 10-Q and other filings with the SEC, you should not rely upon forward-looking statements as predictions of future events. Except as required by law, we assume no obligation to update these forward-looking statements or to update the reasons actual results differ materially from those anticipated in the forward-looking statements. Now I'd like to turn the call over to Dan. Dan? Thanks, Annie, and good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our Q4 earnings call. I wanted to start by acknowledging the end of our first fiscal year as a public company. It has been an exciting journey. We have seen our team align around an expanded vision and in turn deliver consistent innovation that is bringing that vision to life. We have continued to drive widespread penetration and adoption at hundreds of thousands of customers around the world, making a significant impact on their businesses. And after spending the last two days with about 1,500 of our employees at our global kickoff here in San Francisco, I couldn't be more excited about what's to come. Against that backdrop, I want to cover three key areas in my remarks today, starting with a summary of our performance in Q4 and fiscal 19, moving on to our priorities for fiscal 20, and ending with some important factors that elevate our brand and drive customer success. I'll then hand it over to Mike to address our financials in detail. So, let's start with our performance. Overall, DocuSign had a strong Q4, which in turn contributed to a very solid fiscal year. Total fourth quarter revenue came in at $200 million, representing 34% growth versus Q4 a year ago. We were again profitable on a non-GAAP basis, an operating profit of $7 million for the quarter. And we generated $23 million in free cash flow. This means we are exiting our first year as a public company with annual revenue of $701 million, reflecting 35% growth and a positive non-GAAP operating margin of 2%. Now, our growth continues to be driven by three primary factors, acquiring new customers, expanding volumes and use cases within existing customers, all while bringing new and innovative solutions to market. As a result of this, the end of Q4, we had 477,000 paying customers, an increase of 22,000 since Q3 and more than 100,000 since this time last year. 
Now, consistent with previous quarters, this growth is not limited to the U.S. Earlier today, we announced our expansion in Toronto with the opening of our new Canadian headquarters. And we're looking forward to building a larger team to drive growth in this attractive market. In total, our international business contributed 17% to the overall revenue for the fourth quarter, as well as fiscal 19. And it remains an area of keen focus for us going forward. Now, let's turn to our priorities for fiscal 20. When we think about the opportunity the year presents, it falls into two main buckets, the innovation we are bringing to market and the ways we're helping our customers succeed on our platform. Speaking to innovation, this year we'll see DocuSign continue our journey to simplify life and accelerate the process of doing business. We pioneered the technology and the category of e-signature, and we built an incredibly strong business as a result. <clears throat> Yet we're still only scratching the surface of the $25 billion TAM. As the world leader in this category, we remain 100% committed to it and to consistently innovating in e-signature in the years to come. At our IPO last year, we outlined our broader vision to build on our strength in e-signature and help companies modernize their entire systems of agreement. That is, the way they prepare, sign, act on, and manage the agreements that are fundamental to their business. Now, to help deliver on that vision, we acquired contract lifecycle management leader Spring CM in September last year. Given that technologies automated processes before and after the signature, it was a perfect match, validated by the fact that our products were already integrated at more than 100 joint customers. Since completing the acquisition, our Better Together value proposition has been very well received by the DocuSign customer base. We have closed deals that Spring CM alone would not likely have access. For example, with one of the world's largest telephone companies. The presence of Spring CM in our portfolio is also helping to further differentiate the DocuSign e-signature offering. In some cases, we've been able to sell Spring CM along with e-signature to brand new customers. In other cases, we have achieved, achieved a competitive advantage by winning e-signature only deals because the customer sees the desirability of adding Spring CM later. All of these outcomes have validated our thinking on the attractiveness of acquiring Spring CM. Next, I'd like to highlight some positive developments with one of our most important partners, Salesforce. Just last week, we announced DocuSign for Salesforce Essentials. It's a version of our e-signature technology designed specifically for use with Salesforce's product for small businesses. <clears throat> when you consider there are 125 small businesses in the world, and most of them are still scanning, faxing, and printing documents for signature, <clears throat> you can see our excitement to collaborate with Salesforce to provide an alternative that's faster, more cost-efficient, and better for the environment. Because DocuSign for Salesforce Essentials is for SMBs. We focus on ease of setup, administration, and document sending, all done from within the Salesforce user interface. In creating this product, we are excited to use Salesforce's latest platform technology, Lightning, which makes the user experience particularly seamless and modern. In a similar vein, we will soon be announcing the general availability of a product I mentioned during our Q2, Q2 call when it was in beta, DocuSign Gen for Salesforce. This allows sales reps to automatically generate signature-ready contracts with a few clicks, driven by data from a Salesforce opportunity. It's a great example of how we're expanding into other stages of the agreement process, in this case, preparing agreement. It's also a great example of the leverage we're beginning to see from Spring CM, which brought technology and people 
to the Gen for Salesforce opportunity. We expect Gen for Salesforce to provide a great new way for customers to use DocuSign and Salesforce together to accelerate the preparation of their agreement. So, to summarize my update on innovation, Spring CM value proposition is proving out. Two, with DocuSign for Salesforce Essential and DocuSign Gen for Salesforce, we have two great new opportunities to accelerate sales process in partnership with Salesforce. Three, we are hard at work on other innovations, both for our core e-signature business and for delivering on our broader system of agreement vision. And lastly, four, we continue to look at opportunities both internally and externally to build out on that vision. The next area I want to cover today is our relentless commitment to customer success. As you know, our strategy is to land the customers with an initial use case or two and build up from there. Integral to that process is our customer success organization. That group was initially small and focused primarily on helping our largest customers to streamline processes and drive increased ROI. They have been highly effective at this, growing the number of customers we have with ACVs over $300,000 by 50% in fiscal 19. With just over 300 customers above that threshold now, plenty of opportunity remains. Today, customer success is also one of the fastest growing internal teams. And now, we are expanding the function across our entire customer base. This includes dedicated customer success managers working with our largest customers, to those driving adoption in the mid-market, through to the development of automated programs that help our SMB customers. We are also adding new rapid adoption and onboarding programs so that all of our customers are getting the access and assistance they need to be successful. Now, before I hand over to Mike, I want to spend a moment talking about two more areas that are not only important to me personally, but also to our employees, as they help to make DocuSign a special company to be a part of. The first is DocuSign Impact. This is our commitment to harnessing the power of our people, products, and profit for good. Our goal is to make a difference in the global communities where our employees and customers live and work. As part of this effort, we recently unveiled the DocuSign for Forests initiative, where we will commit $1.5 million this year to supporting organizations doing critical work to preserve the world's forests. The first grant was matched by me personally to total $1 million, will be going to the Jane Goodall Legacy Foundation. I had the privilege of spending time with Jane, a hero of mine, at the World Economic Forum in January this year, where we together outlined our overall commitment to fighting for the world's forests by reducing the global demand for paper. It's an initiative I'm very proud of, and it builds on something every DocuSign customer already does simply by using our product. Consume less paper, which means fewer trees need to be cut down, which clearly translates into a more sustainable environment. The second area I wanted to address is that of culture, which is the bedrock of success for any company especially one that's growing as rapidly as ours. We want to create a place where people can do the best work of their lives. Now, while I do love our Glassdoor rating, where we were the 17th best place to work out of over 700,000 this past year, it's about more than that. We track an employee success index, the composite rating of our attrition compared to benchmarks, employee referral rates, manager ratings, etc. We also measure our employee engagement via short surveys twice a year. And I personally read every single comment that's offered by every employee, which is a time investment for sure, but it fosters an open culture and it helps us all to stay connected to each other. With that, I am incredibly proud of what this team has accomplished in our just completed fiscal year. Our finance and legal teams have been a huge part of that success, 
as we completed an IPO, a secondary, a convertible debt offering, and an acquisition in six months. I can't thank them enough. I wanted to also mention that after over four years at DocuSign, Reggie Davis, our general counsel, has decided to take some much-deserved time off to spend with his family beginning later this month. Reggie played a key role in our IPO and, indeed, at the company overall, so I wanted to personally thank him for his contribution. With that, I think the entire Team DocuSign should be proud of an incredible freshman year as a public company. We beat our financial goals while aggressively investing in the future and never, ever losing our focus on ensuring the success of our customers. I feel so incredibly fortunate to call this group my colleagues and to call this place home. I'd now like to hand over to Mike to walk through our financials, and we'll take Q&A after that. Mike? Thanks, Dan, and good afternoon, everyone. First, let me remind you that all of our financial results reflect the adoption of the 606 accounting standard for current and historical periods. The non-GAAP results I will discuss on this call exclude stock-based compensation, amortization of intangibles, amortization of debt discount, and acquisition-related costs. Fiscal 2019 was a milestone year for DocuSign. In addition to the list of accomplishments Dan laid out, we delivered a year of outstanding financial performance from top to bottom, including continued strong global growth, a full year of profitability, and increased positive cash flow. We ended the year with a strong fourth quarter with significant contributions to growth from all of our global regions. Fourth quarter revenue reached $200 million, a 34% year-over-year increase, bringing total revenue for the year to $701 million, an increase of 35%. Subscription revenue grew 37% year-over-year in the fourth quarter to $188 million, or 94% of total revenue. For the full year, subscription revenue totaled $664 million, an increase of 37%. Fourth quarter billings rose 31% year-over-year to a record $262 million. For the full year, billings increased 34% to $801 million. We added 23,000 new customers to our installed base in the fourth quarter, growing 28% year-over-year to 477,000 customers. The number of our enterprise and commercial customers grew to 56,000 in Q4, an increase of 32% year-over-year. Net dollar retention was 112% in Q4, and remained within our historical range of 112 to 119%. Customers with ACVs greater than $300,000 grew 50% year-over-year to 310 customers at year-end. This was driven primarily by existing customers continuing to increase their volumes and expand their use cases. Our international regions continued to generate strong growth in Q4, with revenues from DocuSign core products growing over 40% year-over-year. Total international revenues grew at 26% year-over-year. This lower percentage growth for total international revenues relates to the sunsetting of legacy acquired products. Gross margin for the fourth quarter was 78% compared with 80% in last year's fourth quarter, primarily due to the impact of spring CM's lower margins. For the full year, Gross margin was 80% compared with 79% last year. Fourth quarter subscription gross margin was 85%, consistent with the prior Q4. For the full year, subscription gross margin rose to 86%, compared with 84% last year. Operating leverage improved in Q4 as sales and marketing had a seasonal decrease as a percentage of revenue and G&A expenses returned to more normalized level after our equity and debt transactions. In total, operating expenses totaled $149 million, or 75% of revenue in Q4, compared with $117 million, or 79% of revenue in the prior year. For the full year, operating expenses totaled $544 million, or 78% of revenue, compared with $421 million, or 81% of revenue, in fiscal 18. 
This resulted in fourth quarter operating margin of 4% versus 2% in Q4 of last year. For the full year, we generated 2% operating margin, up from a 2% operating loss in fiscal 18. We ended the year with 3,023 employees, an increase of 33%. Fourth quarter net income was $10 million, or $0.06 per share, compared with $500,000, or $0.01 per share, in last year's Q4. Net income for the full year was $18 million, or $0.09 per share, compared with a net loss of $12 million, or $0.43 per share, in fiscal 18. Turning to cash flow, we generated record operating cash flow of $34 million in the fourth quarter, compared with $32 million in the same quarter last year. This includes the impact of a one-time payment of $14 million in Q4 for employer payroll taxes related to our RSU settlement. Excluding the impact of this payment, operating cash flows in Q4 were $48 million, a 50% increase year over year. Free cash flow was $23 million in the fourth quarter compared with $29 million in Q4 of last year. Excluding the impact of the one-time tax payment, our Q4 free cash flow was a record $37 million, or 19% of total revenue. Turning to our guidance for the first quarter and full year of fiscal 20, we estimate that revenue will range between 205 and $210 million in Q1 and $910 to $915 million for fiscal 20. And billings will range from $210 to $220 million in Q1 and $1 billion, $10 million to $1 billion, $30 million for fiscal 20. We expect gross margin to be 78 to 80% for Q1 and the fiscal year. For our operating expenses, we expect sales and marketing in the range of 48 to 50% of revenues in Q1 and for fiscal 20. We expect R&D in the range of 15 to 17% for Q1 and fiscal 20, and G&A in the range of 10 to 12% for Q1 and fiscal 20. For the first quarter, we expect three to four million dollars of interest and other non-operating income, including interest income and expense associated with the convertible debt. And for the fiscal year, we expect interest and other non-operating income of 12 to 16 million dollars. We expect a tax provision of 2.3 million dollars for the first quarter and eight to 10 million dollars for the fiscal year. We expect fully diluted weighted average shares outstanding of 185 to 190 million shares for Q1 and 190 to 195 million shares for fiscal 20. Finally, I'd like to provide some information regarding anticipated capital expenditures in fiscal 20. We expect to spend 60 to 70 million dollars on capital investments in fiscal 20 compared to the 30 million dollars spent in fiscal 19. This increased level of investment relates primarily to the continued facility and other infra infrastructure expansions in our international re regions, particularly Dublin, and our expansion of strategic data centers, including a dedicated data center for the federal government vertical. While we don't expect to continue at these levels every year, we do foresee an impact on free cash flow growth rates in fiscal 20 as we make these investments and 15 to $20 million of that investment will uh, occur in the first quarter. In closing, I'm very pleased with our execution this year. Our first year as a public company. We are excited to enter fiscal 20 with strong momentum in our global markets. Thanks again for joining us today, and we can now go to Q&A. Thank you. At this time, we'll be conducting a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. A confirmation tone will indicate your line is in the question queue. You may press star 2 if you would like to remove your question from the queue. For participants using speaker equipment, it may be necessary to pick up your handset before pressing the star key. One moment, please, while we poll for questions. Our first question comes from the, comes from the line of Sterling Audi with J.P. Morgan. Please proceed with your question. Yeah, thanks. Hi, guys. I wanted to touch upon uh, one of the last elements you mentioned, the dedicated data center for, for federal. Given the passage of the, the legislation, it looks like you're ramping up uh, for that opportunity. 
any insight you can give us in terms of what we should expect in terms of the uptake from, from that vertical in this fiscal year? Sure. I mean, I think the perspective we have, Sterling, is this is, as we've always said, a huge long-term opportunity for us. And when we looked at the opportunity getting FedRAMP certified, uh, our perspective was this was an increase to our TAM. This gave us an opportunity to have, uh, you know, just a, a, simply a bigger opportunity. Uh, one of the challenges with the federal government, as I'm sure you'll understand, uh, is the cycle time for getting things done it can sometimes be, you know, slower uh, than we see with some of our uh, commercial segments. Uh, so we have a lot of enthusiasm with this uh, opportunity, and the IDEA Act is going to create uh, even more, and I would argue some more urgency uh, in that, uh, you know, agencies have six months to put together their plan, but it is put together a plan, uh, and we're not going to assume any significant change to our fiscal year 20 uh, revenues from this, but we are looking at this, again, as a, a further opportunity to be more bullish about the TAM in the long term. And, Sterling, I would add, as we've talked about in the past, one thing we are always going to prioritize is growth, and even if in fiscal 20 we don't see this um, – having enough runway to be a, a huge contributor in fiscal 20, we absolutely think that it, it represents that longer-term opportunity and, and we're going to invest accordingly. Okay. And then one follow-up question. In the enterprise and commercial customers, the, the growth rate through the year, you know, kind of mimicked what you saw in, in terms of your, your revenue growth. How should we think about that next year? Do we start to get more leverage out of that existing base? So perhaps, you know, maybe the growth rate in customers is not, you know, spot on with revenue growth, but we get more contribution per customer? Well, I would say this, Sterling. I, I think the, the relevance of the uh, the new customer growth isn't so much in terms of near-term revenue uh, trends just because as they come on board, they generally start um, as the, just the land uh, level of their uh, total account size, and that grows over time. And then on a subscription model, in the near term, they don't contribute um, as much of a percentage of revenue as the uh, expansion of the install base does. But with that said, it is an important statistic in terms of planting the seeds for those continued expansions going forward. And so a correlation of that growth rate percent to a revenue growth rate probably isn't um, the extremely connected just because um, of, of what I just described. But generally speaking, um, yeah, we're gonna, it should be a good indication how we continue to penetrate penetrate the market. Yeah. The only other thing I would add is don't forget, so we are very early innings of this game. So the construct of thinking that we're coming to a sort of a turning point or some sort, some sort of plateau is just not right. If you look at the TAM just on a signature, the one we understand much more clearly uh, at about $25 billion and growing, and you compare that to where we are in a total revenue standpoint, you know, we're only a few percent of the way there. So I don't think you'll see any uh, sort of plateauing again of any of those uh, of those factors. Got it. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Stan Lotsky with Morgan Stanley. Please proceed with your question. All right. Perfect. Um, uh, let me let me start off with um, Spring CM. So sounds like that acquisition is doing very well under the DocuSign umbrella. Um, Dan, um, how are you thinking about Spring CM and the, the selling motion uh, and the go to market there for fiscal 20? And then um, Mike, did you um, maybe I missed it? Did you give us a uh, contribution from Spring CM in the quarter? And then I have a quick follow up. Okay, I'll start, and you can talk about sure. the Yeah, so the way we're thinking about it, you know, our goal, Stan, was by the time we got to the field kickoff that I just referred to, our, our GKO that occurred this week, was we wanted to have uh, the Springers, as, as I particularly affectionately call them, uh, given my name, fully integrated into DocuSign by kickoff, and uh, we've accomplished that. And so we have integrated uh, the sales plans and the sales organization. We even have uh, a seasoned sales leader from uh, DocuSign that we've had moved to Chicago, which is where uh, sort of the Spring headquarters is located and an opportunity to work closely and really bring the two businesses together. So going forward, we're thinking about it as one uh, integrated business, uh, and we're really bullish uh, that that's going to set us up for a fantastic 2020. Yeah, and in terms of contribution from Spring Stan, uh, we're not uh, breaking that out in our guidance going forward. And for Q4, it was right in line with what we had guided last quarter. Okay, got it. Thank you. And then a uh, quick follow-up uh, from Mike. Um, when when you look at Q4, 
you for billings. Was there anything unusual in the quarter? Um, the numbers came in, you know, ahead of consensus. Uh, but you know, was there some, um, you know, deals, you know, flowing in and out? You know, maybe, um, you know, some effects or, or anything else? You know, payment term changes, anything like that? No, all very standard. Standard. One thing that I point out each quarter is that that particular statistic um, is going to be affected by timing of renewals and orders coming in and so forth. So. Um, overall, the the, uh, the meaningful percentage increase, I think, is when we look at the fiscal year. If you look at Q3, it was spiked up a little bit higher, and Q4 is a little bit lower. And so that that broader average, I think, is um, is important to look at in terms of the underlying fundamental strength of the orders that we received and the payment terms and all of that was very consistent with prior quarters. Got it. All right. Thank you, guys. Our next question comes from the line of Walter Pritchard with Citi. Please proceed with your question. Hi, thanks. Um, two questions. First, on um, maybe on spring, you talked about benefits to core signing as well as selling spring standalone. How do you how do you think that'll play out next year as you go to market kind of more deliberately with the strategy that, that you set at sales kickoff and so forth um, in terms of selling the you know the, the add-on versus versus the core as, as the benefit there? And then I did have a follow-up. Sure. Well, I think there's a couple different motions. Look, as we talked about before, this construct of a system of agreement, every company has one, Whether again, whether they think about it that way or not, many do, many don't. Uh, we have the ability and we have now trained up our sales team to go and talk about our broader solution set for that overall system of agreement that they have, and we will lead with that messaging and positioning. At the same time, we realize we're still going to have plenty of customers that in the marketplace come out and say, e-signature is a huge opportunity for us to digitally transform our company, and they want to buy an e-signature solution. They know that DocuSign is the clear and strong leader in that space, and that's what they're going to ask for. And in that situation, we will smile and sell them an e-signature solution, right, as is the only logical thing to do. Um, but we will have the opportunity in that process to say, we're excited to get you started with e-signature. Here's our overall vision for how you should think in the long term about that system of agreement, and Spring will be a key part to showing them some of the other components uh, you know, of that overall system. So I think you're going to see us have both of those uh, sales motions, uh, and I think the answer is we're going to be dictated by the individual customer and how they want to buy, uh, but the key is uh, it, we're, whether we're selling them a broader solution up front or not, we're positioning them for the broader opportunity going forward. And then, Dan, a follow-up, or just on international, how are you thinking about 2020 relative to, you know, countries that may be inflecting, in, in, uh, especially in Europe, and, and anything, to, anything to any countries that we should be watching? Yeah, so a couple of things. We did note, you know, the uh, investment with the, the Toronto office, which we're super excited about. Uh, we think Canada, you know, is uh, a great opportunity for us uh, within international and North America. Um, and then I think you're spot on. Europe is the biggest growth opportunity for us uh, outside of North America. Uh, from a scale standpoint, it is, the, you know, the biggest theater uh, we have today. Uh, but I, I would tell you, uh, I'm also very excited about what we see in Latin America, uh, and I also think that the overall APAC opportunity, you know, we've been very uh, sort of Australia-centric, as most software companies are uh, when they uh, head into Asia-PAC, uh, but we've seen some great successes, you know, moving further north. And uh, I, I think you're going to see us investing pretty aggressively across the board, uh, but you're absolutely right that Europe will be the single largest contributor uh, to that international growth. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Alex Zukin with Piper Jaffrey. Please proceed with your question. Hey, guys. Thanks for taking my question. I apologize for uh, any background noise. Uh, maybe first, just one more time on Sterling's question about just the magnitude of the TAM expansion from the federal vertical uh, that you see uh, potentially, and, and maybe how does the average deal size in that vertical that you uh, are looking at in your pipeline compare to kind of a more traditional commercial enterprise deal? Uh, and then I've got yeah. a quick follow-up. Yeah, well, I think I think the answer to deal size is, is a very important uh, differentiator, and I made the comment before that hey, we expect you know some of those federal government uh, sort of processes to still take a little bit longer and the cycles to be longer, um, but the visibility to a much larger 
opportunity in those accounts is very clear. And so when we think about a, a typical commercial deal in maybe like our largest vertical financial services, we, we, we talk about this concept. Of it's pretty small land, right? We might just get a couple of use cases. Uh, it could be a very low MER start, and we see that being an opportunity to become one of our more than $300,000, you know, ACV customers that we, that we talk about. But when you look at the federal and you just think about some of the individual groups there, we look at those as being able to eclipse that $300,000 $300, ACV on an initial signing, sometime, you know, by, by a multiple factor of that. So we do see the opportunity for some much bigger uh, win, uh, but I still think we're going to see the overall cycle time being a little bit slower. Perfect. That's helpful. And maybe just one on dollar-based net expansion. I'm, I don't know if uh, I may have missed if you called out what it was in the quarter, but maybe just given the success of Spring CM and the cross selling uh, and, and the just larger lands, how do you see, uh, or how should we be thinking about that metric for fiscal 20? Actually, the metric I lost you is which metric? Uh, dollar-based dollar net expansion. Yeah, so it, it uh, is kind of in fiscal 20, uh, stay in the same range we've seen historically, which is anywhere from 112 to 119. My expectation is in those in that mid zone is is uh, where we'll continue to sustain the business. Our next question comes from line of Justin Furby with William Blair. Please proceed with your question. Thanks, guys. Um, just, I guess, to start out, I was wanted to ask on just rep productivity, what you saw sort of pre and post IPO, any noticeable change there, and then when you look out to your your sales plans, your hiring plans for fiscal 20, should we be thinking about it sort of at a similar rate of, of, of sort of sales and marketing OPEX growth, or or any kind of commentary around fiscal 20 and your plans there would be helpful? And I've got just a quick follow up. Sure. Let me talk a little bit about the rep side, and then you can talk more sure. about the uh, impact that will have financial. Uh, so we didn't have any significant change uh, either way. I think our productivity was uh, relatively consistent uh, from a rep standpoint. There were a couple things that we did uh, last year, which I think uh, turned out to be very well for us, is we hired a little bit ahead of the curve. We used to have a model where we sort of got through a year, and then we did a whole bunch of hiring at the beginning of the year in our field sales force. Um, and then sometimes, you know, when you do that, there's a little bit of a productivity hit until you get them all up to, up to speed. And now what we're trying to do is do that hiring a little more evenly throughout the year. So what that led us to do last year was pull forward some hiring, and we pulled forward some costs, and we talked about that throughout the year. Um, that did lead to some very strong revenue growth, uh, particularly in the uh, later parts of the year, uh, but also I think set us up to be very confident uh, about uh, our fiscal 20 because we have more uh, folks in seat that have already had several months with us and are up to speed. So I think we feel really good about that. And I think going forward, you'll see us moving to that model of more consistent ads so you won't see kind of the big uh, step changes in that aspect of the business. So maybe a smoother uh, increase in that spending. Uh, and then Mike can talk about the percentage. We don't see that uh, – percentage of sales and marketing changing dramatically uh, through the year? Well, a couple things, Justin. One, you you, uh, you mentioned the IPO specifically. Um, I don't know that we could generate any specific data on that, but qualitatively I have heard from our enterprise teams in particular that um, the IPO has been helpful in terms of their customers understanding the, uh, the scale and strength of our company, and that uh, was something that as a private company wasn't always as evident. So in that regard, there are some qualitative benefits that, uh, that we've gotten from from being public. In terms of our hiring plans for fiscal 20, I think Dan's uh, correct. They, they largely, or you're, you're, I went through in the guidance, the leverage improvements that we're going to see. So overall, uh, we'll be more leveraged and, and productive in that sense. But, um, you know, some of the um, aspirations we have with spring and other new products over time, driving up those productivity statistics, those are certainly part of our, of our vision. I think in fiscal 20, they're going to be uh, relatively stable because they're still in the early innings of rolling some of that stuff out. Okay, got it. That's helpful. And then just Salesforce, just given some of the new announcements, can you just remind us, um, Dan, how what the overlap is today? If you look at Salesforce's base, like how how much opportunity is there to just go after their existing install base? And this on the essential side, any sense for what the opportunity there is in terms of if the TAM is 25 billion, 
is that a subset of it, or how, how do you think about opportunity there? Thanks. Yeah. So Salesforce, you know, you've heard us talk a lot about Salesforce. We have made a dramatic investment in the relationship overall, and it's everything from the product pieces you just alluded to to the alignment of our go-to-market efforts, really quite frankly, to the connections of the company. And that we talked about our uh, sort of actions we took on the environmental front. A lot of that had to do with Mark Benioff asking us to come, you know, uh, with them effectively to Davos, the World Economic Forum, and try to play a role in, in having a big impact on the environment. So we're really kind of connecting at multiple levels. Uh, uh, with what I think is a fantastic software company. Uh, from, from your specific question around the size of the opportunity, um, you know, we, we believe that while Salesforce has a you know, large number of customers and we do have a lot of overlap and it's a significant driver, it's still a small piece of the overall TAM. Uh, we think that there are so many small businesses that they don't have in essentials or, or other relationships with and so many right up through the stack from a um, mid-market all the way through to enterprise, which is why we sell so aggressively directly. Um, but I believe uh, Salesforce is our, you know, one of our most important go-to-market partners, but any one of them is still a very small percentage of the total uh, TAM market opportunity. So we wouldn't be um, in any way reliant on them, but it sure is a nice turbocharged boost to have that kind of a strong partnership. Yeah, that's helpful. And then, Mike, if I could sneak one more in, when does the when do the headwinds on the international side sort of anniversary, if you will? Yeah, I mean, I think if you um, the further away you move from uh, when the acquisitions took place and the revenues were more material to our prior periods, you'll just see each year, like we just completed fiscal nineteen. Obviously, the percentage of those legacy products made up of our business was smaller, and next year it'll be smaller again. But I think that overall, um, you'll continue to see international now start to turn um, into a you know a, a growing percentage of our business um, this year it was about a 120 million dollar business uh, which over the relatively short period of time we've been focused on it we're, we're really satisfied with it great thanks guys our next question comes from a line of Ted Lynn with Goldman Sachs please proceed with the question Great. Good afternoon, and thank you very much for taking the question. Um, digging a little bit into your FY20 guidance, which I think is for roughly 30% growth, can you maybe help us break that down, maybe qualitatively, by the three factors called out by Dan, which I think were acquiring new customers, uh, expanding volumes, and, and bringing kind of new solutions to market? You want to start? Yeah, so I'll start on the qualitative side. I mean, for us, if you do get the simple uh, sort of math of it, Ted, the biggest driver in any year is always going to be that second bucket, which is sort of the expansion, because when we bring in a new customers in you know, our land model, um, even if some of them are those larger uh, federal government cases we talked about earlier, it's going to be a small portion of our overall revenue growth, because we do tend to have that land with a smaller number of use cases. So by far, the biggest driver is going to be that middle bucket. Um, I do think we have some uh, nice opportunity uh, with new product introductions. We, we talked about a couple of those today, and we've got um, important new ones coming up uh, in the next few weeks. We're excited. I want you to stay tuned. We're going to have uh, additional uh, fantastic system of agreement uh, extension that we that we want to talk about. Um, and at the same time, I still think even those will be uh, overwhelmed by that second bucket of the core growth with that uh, increasingly strong customer base of 477,000 customers uh, that we think can, uh, uh, you know, be a, a huge uh, growth opportunity for us. So that's kind of my view on the Rob, Do you have anything quantitative you'd yeah, add? Or? I, I think that uh, that's spot on. I think for that middle category, that number of customers that are exceeding the 300K threshold, um, as that continues to grow, I think that's a good way to, to just measure and see what's, what's happening in that existing in, installed base of our business. If you think of it from an investment standpoint, while new customers don't make up a, a large percentage of, of the guided revenue growth, um, for all the reasons Dan just summarized, if you look at our investments, we're investing aggressively and continuing to expand the number of, of reps that are out there um, driving new customer growth because for our overall long-term growth, obviously those, as I mentioned before, are the seeds that we have to keep planting, and we're having great success with that. Investing in um, that installed base, our customer success organization, on top of our sales organization, really focused on consumption, driving upsells, mitigating churn, 
Uh, we're going to continue to uh, uh, invest aggressively in that. And then in new products, obviously, the, uh, the movements you've seen around SEAL, uh, the significant percentage of our revenues that we're investing in R&D, all targeted at, at that growth driver. So as a business, we're focused on all three. In terms of the guidance, that middle category is the biggest contributor. Great, thanks. That's super helpful. Um, and then on the uh, on the competitive environment, um, are you seeing kind of hello sign uh, any more these days after the acquisition by Dropbox? Um, and is there any kind of competitive update with respect to Adobe and, and how much you're seeing that solution? Thanks. Uh, the, the simple answer to the first question is no. And remember, when we have seen in the past uh, hello sign. It's sort of hard to see in the standpoint that they're very small customers. We don't see them in a lot of sort of competitive direct deals, but rather in the web and mobile. Uh, we don't get, you know, as much intelligence uh, about those transactions because they're not dealing with an individual here, rather just with our e-commerce solution. But we haven't seen any change uh, in what was, you know, a smallish, num- you know, impact to begin with. Um, and I don't think there's anything else that I've seen different, noteworthy at all, from a competitive standpoint uh, in in this last quarter, really across the year. Uh, I think it's pretty consistent with what we shared um, on on the roadshow around the IPO, which was then unchanged really when we got to the secondary. Um, I don't know if you have anything else you picked up, Mike, but I think it's pretty consistent. Great to hear. Thanks for taking the questions. Yeah, thank you. As a reminder, if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. As a reminder, if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. One moment, please, as we pull for more questions. Our next question comes from line of Carl Kirstead with Deutsche Bank. Please proceed with your question. Uh, thank you. Um, I've got two, two billings questions for, uh, for Mike. So, Mike, in the, in the four quarters that DocuSign has been public, um, as you know, there's been some big variation in the degree of billings uh, outperformance. Q1 and Q3 were huge billing beats, and 2Q and the quarter just reported were more modest. I know it's super tough, obviously, to predict billings, but what are the big what are the bigger swing factors uh, driving that? You mentioned uh, in an answer to a prior question, maybe renewal activity, but it'd be nice to hear you elaborate on on the variation we've seen. Yeah, I think two things, uh, Carl. First of all, you know, as we talked about, a lot of SaaS businesses actually don't guide billings because of, of the uh, the variability of the factors that, that can uh, create some of the effects you're talking about. And I think about uh, two of them uh, being pretty key. One is that obviously a big portion of billings is the, the timing of a renewal order. If a renewal order comes in on the last day of the quarter, it goes into that quarter. And if it comes in the first day of the new quarter, it goes into that quarter. So, Exact timing of when our renewable uh, book of business comes in can can ca- uh, cause one quarter to the next some some variability. I think also those variables that affect the prior year quarter that you're comparing to, you might have a double effect where in the prior quarter you have a tough comp because you had a, a really high billings percentage. For example, Q3 of fiscal 19, I believe, and I don't have it in front of me, but I think it grew something like 40%. Well, Clearly, that's a little bit higher than what the underlying growth rate of the business is, and this quarter was a little bit lower than that, it's a little bit lower. So next Q3, we're going to be comparing against the 40% growth rate because of some of these timing differences that affected Q3. So I continue to try to remind everybody I want to guide the billings because I think it's, it's a good, transparent way of giving an indication in terms of how we see our future developing. But on a quarter-to-quarter basis, it is a statistic that will that's subject to some of that variability. Yep, that makes sense. And then maybe my second related question is, I'm just looking at your billings guide for fiscal 20, 1.03 billion up 29% of the high end. Uh, seems pretty strong to me. Mike, when we go back to when you went public, you initially got it to fiscal 19 billings of uh, 680 to 700 million. And you just finished the fiscal year with 801, so uh, quite a bit of upside. I don't think anyone's expecting that degree of upside to your new guidance, but what I wanted to ask you is, whether, uh, A, generally your guidance philosophy has changed at all, and secondly, whether the key factors that drove that upside in fiscal 19, whether it's renewal activity or other things, are they generally, you know, in place to roughly the same degree in fiscal 20? Yeah, I would say two things, Carl. First, any time I think a business goes public, it's always going to be a bit more prudent at the beginning of, of that uh, new environment than as, as we mature into that environment. So, so that's always something to uh, 
to keep in mind, and I think the underlying drivers of our billings growth are the same ones that we're referring to in our in our overall revenue growth. And obviously, I think the guidance that we're providing for this upcoming fiscal year indicates that we continue to have really strong confidence in in uh, what's going to drive that growth. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, great. Congrats on the uh, on the strong guidance for this fiscal year. Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, we have reached the end of the question and answer session, and I would like to turn a call back to management for closing remarks. Uh, thank you again for joining us and your support over our first year as a public company. We look forward to seeing many of you out on the road in the coming months, and uh, hope we'll have the opportunity to see you all soon. Thank you. This concludes today's conference. You may disconnect your lines at this time. Thank you for your participation.